you have the opportunity when you're posting your question uh, to state your name. And I'm particularly grateful to Anonymous, um, <laughs> who has posted quite a lot of questions already. So well done, you. Uh, but I'm going to ask a question from Brooke Knight, who has actually told us uh, their name. What advice would you give to young individuals starting out right now for a career in the transport industry? Well, if I sort of took a step back a bit, uh, even before they start, is to try and look at getting on some training agreement, whether that's a, at a graduate level, um, at a technician level or apprentice. So um, I was very fortunate um, when I joined local government that I was on a four-year IC training scheme and Lincolnshire, a uh, credit to them, they rigidly followed that. So I had a fantastic grounding in, this, in, the, in the local authority sector, getting around all the different departments. So my first bit of advice is, you know, try your best. I know, you know, it's quite competitive, but if you can get on a formal training scheme, that really provides a good uh, stepping stone then to help your career and go forward. Okay, thank you. One of the things I would advocate is important is for engineers to um, take on board the fact that you get your best outcomes and solutions when you work as part of a multidiscipline team, when you acknowledge that you know, engineers can't do everything and that we do need planners, lawyers to work collaboratively as a team. Um, I was really impressed with a piece of work that a couple of young engineers at Transport for London started called Grapple which is a graduate and apprentice learning environment. And they've got together with a whole host of organisations that TFL work with, legal people, HR people, planning people. Um, and they're taking or tackling kind of current issues like productivity or what have you um, as a group of people a multidiscipline team, and then they're presenting back to senior people in the industry. And I think that is really um, a very, very um, important aspect, is, is making sort of... And the other thing that I would advocate um, is that they challenge um, organisations to introduce a reverse mentoring programme. Uh -huh. So, actually, where you're turning it on its head and the people who are learning are giving advice to those above them about their experiences. So there's a, two things I would recommend. I do quite a bit of talking to schools and trying to encourage people in a structured way that, to come and join our industry. And I think you've got to give them the, the understanding. They've got to set their expectations. You know, we, we took on some, some QSs and put them through a, a foundation course. And the first thing I went and talked to them, and the first thing they said was, when do I go to Crossrail? No, I don't. I don't mind. You know, this count, counting potholes isn't uh, isn't what I was brought into the industry for. And you just got to expect them. There is a, a tendency for the, today's youth to actually not understand that you've got to start and learn to be a more well-rounded individual. And I think possibly we need to be more honest with people in order to attract them. Because what we don't want is to attract people in and then find they go out the next door to something else. Uh -huh. You know, we've got a fantastic industry. We just do not and do not. And I mean this. We do not sell it enough. This may sound a bit surprising to you, uh, especially as um, you will all have detected my accent. But uh, I, my advice to any person engaging, starting a career in engineering, is to learn to speak and write good English. Um, I find it amazing how poor, how poor, how poorly we represent ourselves in public forums because we can't um, speak um, well. And also when we write reports, our reports tend to be very technical. Another word for it is mundane or boring. And uh, we, could, we could do ourselves much, uh, we could represent ourselves much better if um, we paid more attention with, um, with English. The, uh, somebody said the word is a powerful sword, and I think that will give us the opportunity to um, uh, present ourselves and to stop others from taking the initiative. This, this uh, lack of, of confidence in the written and the verbal word, I think, allows other professions to manage us when in fact it should be the other way around. So that's what I would okay. recommend. But perhaps following on from that, the very popular question here is, um, are we all just too focused on graduates and degrees? We were hearing earlier. Well, let's start with you, Dave. 
What about the folks who aren't going to have degrees? I didn't do a degree, but I did a part-time degree, and that's something we, we've done at Kia and the Foundation. We take them and send them for 12 weeks at a time if they want to do it. If they don't, we give them other options. But I think we're all focusing on we're missing the, the blue-collar bit as well because there is a, there's a, a lot of people in our industry who've come up through the ranks and the, most, and the best operators I've seen are people who are actually started on the tools. And I think it's important that we did give that look at all levels. Um, and I would say this, but if you want to go and look at uh, the Kia stand, there's a thing called Shaping Your World, which again is not just a Kia thing, it's something we give into the whole industry, where it gives you the complete cross-section of opportunities in our industry that some of them are basically not going to be anything, any consequence around a degree. So therefore, yeah, I would agree. So what do you look for? If you're not, it's, it's, I, th I always think it's a rather, um, well, it's a rather easy thing to do to say, well, one of the first cutoffs, you've got to have a degree, you've got to have a 2-1. It just makes life simpler because you can chuck a lot of applications away. If you're not going to use that, then what are the qualities that you're looking for? I think it's the individuals who have shown a willingness to change, learn, be flexible, um, have the right attitude. And, and sometimes you may have to take a chance on somebody. Mm -hmm. I'm a great believer if you give youth a chance, they will come through. I'm not sure there is too much focus on degrees at the moment. I think there's um, quite a, a lot of realisation that the whole route through apprenticeships is a really exciting one. What can be more exciting than earning while you're learning? What can be more exciting than a kind of potential for upskilling in your organisation through apprenticeship? And of course, what pe many people don't realise is that there are level six and seven apprentices, which is a degree equivalent of an apprentice. So I do think that focus is, is going to be changing more rapidly uh, on, the, on the degree. Lots of people have achieved very high things through apprentice routes. So, so Terry Morgan has started off as an apprentice, for example. Um, so I'm not sure it is there. And I was just going to say that, you know, one of the barriers to diversity, of course, is, is this always sort of prescribing the roots in so so I think you know we are appreciating we need to unlock that so it's important that the industry takes in people and you know it, I agree with um, Dave in terms of what we're looking for we're looking for people with um, a can-do attitude you know with a quest to learn but also I think with compassion I, I used to call it passion but I think it's compassion that we're looking for I think the issue is that, you know, we, we can't just rely on graduate intake alone because we're not getting enough throughput, but, but recognising, you know, as we've already touched um, on, that we need that people from a, a wide range of abilities, whether it's technical apprenticeships, but also from different um, skill bases. So certainly within WSP, um, you know, we have statisticians, mathematicians, environmentalists, ecologists, all those people um, we need with those skills, and it doesn't necessarily have to be at a degree level. And I guess my view is that, you know, um, I sort of, my career, I came through a very hierarchical structures within local government where you had to have certain qualifications to get to the next step. I think these days um, organisations are much more agile and good people will shine through whatever um, skills and qualifications they have if they're, if they're ambitious enough and, and able to demonstrate uh, what they do. But um, you know, going specifically to the question, Steve, I think we've got to reach out. We've got to, um, you know, through through some of the things that we're already doing, getting into um, schools to to younger people, and and um, perhaps the point I made in in my presentation, and just demonstrate what a very exciting and um, a challenging but um, a fulfilling career people can have in our sector. And I don't think there's a lot of awareness in young people. They tend to look at very traditional roles. Um, and, and also just to you know, go back to the point about diversity and um, you know, make it more comfortable and uh, to demonstrate that you know, we, we're keen to have people from all backgrounds within the industry. I just wanted to emphasize really how important, in my view, apprentices are. Um, in fact, um, my own career, I've, I've been working in the industry 35 years, is... Um, is, has been very academic, if you like. I haven't had, uh, I haven't had uh, as much experience as I would have liked through the apprentice route, through the more technical side of things. And um, uh, I've learned through working with um, uh, apprentices, technicians, and, and people who came through the industry from a different route to mine, that they, they, are, they are better. 
they, 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 they're, they're better than me, you know, because they've learned it the hard way, the different way, etc. So I very much, I, I'm not suggesting that um, a degree in engineering is, uh, is the wrong thing to do, but I'm saying that there is another route that uh, probably produces a better but um, people for for our uh, profession. Um, if I can just endorse as well the points that uh, Matthew was making about reaching out, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that we can become stronger as a profession by bringing in all these other disciplines. And um, I have given this example before, I'm going to give it again. Um, just over a year ago, I interviewed um, a young lady who, uh, answered an advert for a transport planning position in, in my own consultancy. Um, he, she had done uh, psychology and uh, Japanese at university. And she came to the interview. I was intrigued that she had applied. And she, I said to her, you know, why do you want to become a transport planner? And she said, I'm really interested in it. The more I read about it, the, the more I think it's a fantastic subject. I'm passionate about it. And I want to get into it. So I gave her the job, and it's probably the best thing I've done. She's a star. She's looking at things in a slightly different way from all the other members of staff, the engineers. She's learning very quickly. She wants to, she wants to do well. And, you know, she's really a big plus in the office. We've got this change coming. I think several of you mentioned it in your, in your pieces about... The world of autonomy is coming, the world of artificial intelligence, the world of the driverless car. Can we actually look forward into that world and work out now what we need to be doing? Or is this question, is it, is it just going to bring a fundamental change and we don't really know what on earth that change is going to be? WSP have got an initiative called Future Ready where we're trying to think about what the world will be like in the future, but very much engaging with, with people that have got to live in that world. And I think earlier on today, I think um, our, our colleague from America mentioned that um, we need to um, look at how we develop our society, our infrastructure, in a way that um, is going to be a nice place to live. We can't just look at things in isolation in terms of um, the infrastructure alone. So we, we do need to sort of do some more horizon scanning, just think about you know, how, how people's lifestyles may change, how they might travel, and, and sort of prepare for that rather than just um, look at these individual initiatives and just um, look at things in isolation. Uh, so, you know, th th things will change, but we've got to make sure they change for the better. I've actually had the pleasure of being in an autonomous vehicle, and it's pretty scary. <laughs> okay. You're thinking, who's driving? Um, Tell us, where was this? What, it, where was were we in, going? Um, it was in Australia. We, we were currently doing some trials out there with uh, an autonomous vehicle at the Sydney Olympic Park. Uh, it was, it's a quite a weird feeling. It really is. You know, the imaginary bus stops and things like that. You know, it's, a, it's one of them. But I think the biggest challenge we face is it's not so much the autonomous bit. It's the fact that we're going to change from fossil-based fuel vehicles into electric vehicles. And I think autonomous vehicles will definitely come probably in my lifetime, but the first thing that's going to come is the electrical vehicle. And I think the thing with the electrics is what happens with the fuel duty if we all suddenly become using... What's that bring? And is that an opportunity then for local authorities to actually move into a way that they can apply some charges for the, the time and the, that you use the roads and therefore fund highways in a different way by... In a similar way that I think it's the vehicle excise duty is now mm -hmm. going to fund the strategic road networks going forward and I think that's possibly where it is but autonomous vehicles will come um, I do have this vision about what what the infrastructure look like you know we all get in a car that takes us to the office and then this car disappears where does it go does it park itself or you know I mean I have actually been in a Tesla which is quite impressive yeah. my, my friend sits in his front room and tells it to get out open the garage and gets to the drawer puts the heating on and sits there and waits for him and it can actually, I'm told, drive itself, remembers every journey. So the technology's there, but I'm not sure the infrastructure is yet, but it will come. What does it mean for the infrastructure? It always worries me that, fundamentally, should we not just be focusing, as Mr Pothole uh, was saying on the news this morning, on making sure the road is there and it's, and it's in a good shape? We can't stop progress from happening, so, you know, we must 
be well aware that progress will happen. Um, so yes, it's important we get the basics right, but we should be planning for the future. Um, I struggle personally to, to be able to see into the future. I'm very much looking forward to this afternoon's session, actually, uh, to hear from others. Um, I mean, I remember picking up an iPad or seeing someone with an iPad and thinking, what on earth would anybody want with one of those? Because the size was odd. And, but, you know, you adapt and, and change and look at all the research that went into that in terms of understanding customers. So um, I, 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 all I would say is, going back to my earlier point, that it's very important that it's not just engineers who are working on this whole idea of infrastructure of the future, but it's actually multidisciplinary teams because it involves legal aspects and customer change. I mean, people don't even understand what the Red Cross on a motorway means at the moment, let alone what a whole new state of infrastructure will be. We could chuck that out as an audience question, but I'm not going to because I'm not <laughs> cruel. But I do want to come back to you because one of the things that, that comes out of that answer and that you were saying earlier on was about the importance of customer focus, of not, not thinking purely as an asset steward, but as someone who's providing a service to customers. I'd be interested to hear from all the panel members on, well, how do you know what I want? Because I'm your customer. Dana, what would you say about that? How do you, how do you find out what we're, what we, perhaps what we need as much as what we want? Because what I want might be unreasonable. Well, I, I do think research is extremely important in this area. Um, certainly, um, the research that was done at Transport for London when I was there was quite eye-opening in terms of understanding what was really bugging people and what simple things we could actually do to help you know, with that. Um, I know that the Highways England have done a lot of research recently on understanding their customers. I mean, they've, they've moved quite quickly to a place where they realise they started to need to understand their customers. And some very simple things have come out of their research, you know, just in terms of making it easier and narrow lanes to, for, for people's experience on narrow lanes. So we ask them um, and we engage with them and we respond to them. Also, we get them to un help them understand why certain things can't be done or what the benefits are. I don't, I, I think the, the Smart Motorway programme, for example, um, I don't think the travelling public necessarily understand what it's all about and the fact that you know they're providing so much more capacity for half less than half the price of an alternative mm. option um, you know I just think if people understood the bigger picture then they might be more sort of participating in it I've always sort of championed in the uh, localised I've worked in to get better communication to the public because I think all too often people don't understand why we do things, when we do it, and what we're doing it for. And I just think uh, we, we can't do enough of this. And actually, you know, using um, social media is a fantastic way of getting information out more universally to, you know, all, all ages of the, the population. But it's not just about getting the information out, it's just also, as Dana says, listening and getting information in. And I think, you know, you can look at sort of stakeholder user groups, uh, you know, you've, you've got elected members, obviously they're, they're allegedly representing the community and, and they're a key stakeholder. So, um, you know, I think at a time when budgets are tight, it's an area where we can't afford not to invest because if we don't listen and, and we don't engage, then, you know, we can end up getting it very wrong. I think um, both as providers and clients and public organisations, we've got to change with the times. I mean, I always think of the story of, um, I'm sure everybody remembers, and they had a Nokia 6310 back in the days. Well, Nokia continued, their forward vision was to continue employing telecommunications engineers, where Apple then started employing IT people, looking to the future, and the rest is history. And that will happen, if we don't change the way we look at things, then we will always get the same answer. And I think we've got to be different in our approach. It's interesting, um, I saw something recently where Royal Mail, uh, I was England engaged with Royal <coughs> Mail about what did it mean for them or their, or their roadworks. You know, they're, they're looking at it and I think local authorities need to do the local st stakeholder engagement and it should be done. You should go and tell people why we're doing things, yeah. not let them see the consequences and then have them complain. The more you engage up front, yeah. the less complaints you'll get. I think it's a very good question. How do you know what our customers want? Um, I think I'm going to turn that on its head and say, well, 10 years ago, I didn't really know that I needed to have an iPhone or an iPad, 
It was thrust upon me. It was thrown into our lives by Mr. Steve Jobs. So, so sometimes um, customers don't even know that they need uh, something. Um, but, but what my little story about Steve Jobs illustrates is that we need to be at the forefront of our profession. You know, uh, the point about research, the point about cutting edge, and um, uh, otherwise we will become imitators. We will just take whatever the Japanese and, and our American friends uh, invent. Um, I, I, I read somewhere that um, um, more than 50% of uh, the world's inventions in the last 20 years were done by, by British people. So we need to keep up with that. We need to put more emphasis into where are we going, and, and that way we continue to lead not only our own profession, but, but the world. Since it is, I think, a, a currently a government obligation that any event like this does have to discuss Brexit, we're going to put the Brexit question. What's that going to do to the consulting industry? What's that going to do to the businesses, businesses that you run? I think it's like anything that's uncertain. You know, the recession in 2008, we didn't see that coming and we dealt with it and we had periods of fiscal stimulus, etc. I think the problem with this one is that we're, we're all waiting into this cliff edge that we've known about for two years and, and we're not really certain what the deal we're going to get and what does it mean. But I think the one thing that is clear to me is that we've got to actually cut through it and think post-Brexit we're still going to face the same challenges. Uh, we may have challenges around um, some of the labour. We don't know what, the, you know, we've got labour from other parts of the EU at the moment. I think that's a big challenge, particularly in London. Uh, some of our infrastructure projects are going to be there. But, I'm personally, now we've made the decision, I think we should get on with it and um, we, we look through it and think we should do some contingency planning, obviously, but um, I don't know. I, I just think it's, it's we would spend too much time talking about it rather than actually what are we going to do about it. We should be always thinking, right, it's happened, what does it look like? Part of the question is about um, North American consultants, so WSP are owned by a Canadian um, company. But actually, um, I think having um, international companies probably makes us more resilient to, um, to Brexit in terms of having those global markets. And if uh, we think more generally of the, um, the way that we work in industry, it is around global markets. Uh, and therefore, you know, actually, um, in terms of the consultancy work we do, you know, we, we're not that, influenced by, that much influenced by Europe alone. So, you know, if, if, if the worst consequences of a Brexit happen, I'm not sure that that would impact uh, as much as you might think. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the, the, the worry from the UK perspective is how it's going to affect the, con the economy and, and, the, and the growth that we're currently seeing and the investment in infrastructure, which is absolutely crucial to our economy going forward and, and sort of social well-being and making sure we've got um, uh, housing and, and employment and I think you know that that still is a bit uncertain, but I'm, I suppose I'm the internal optimist as well. And I think you know we need, as I agree with um, what Dave said, we've got to get on with this. We don't want to sort of sit there, um, you know, letting the tsunami hap happen, but mm. get on and and, uh, and continue to do what we do well. I think a no deal Brexit would have a huge um, devastating impact on the economy, actually. And uh, I do think it's important to engage now with supply chain, think about materials, um, and it's important to do that scenario planning now in organisations. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I don't really have much to, to comment on. Okay, that. last week, when it snowed, uh, and it was an, an interesting week, I think, for all of us, both in the transport sector and people trying to get around. And um, I just wonder, Matthew, you... you shared your congratulations for lessons learned and how well it was handled. But what makes you guys think it was handled well? I couldn't get around. My staff had to stay at home. We looked at 10-foot snowdrifts and we thought, what on earth is going on? Could it have been done better? There's always room for improvement. But I think what I saw happening last week was, I certainly think the forecasting's improved. So you know, I think we had better information about what was going on. Um, and I think... Um, a lot of people took notice and perhaps didn't make journeys. Inevitably, some people did, and, and they got into difficulty. Um, but, you know, I think there were quite sort of um, extraordinary circumstances last week that we haven't even seen in those bad winters, actually, um, in the late, um, what, 2010-11, where we had 
um, snow actually blowing and drifting, where, you know, with all the resources in the world, almost, you know, you couldn't keep roads open. Um, so, you know, there is a reality that there are certain weather conditions where, um, you know, people are inevitably going to be affected. And I think the important issue there is, is making sure that people are made aware. And I do think we're much better at getting that information out. You know, I thought, um, you know, there was a lot of good uh, reporting going on about which roads were closed, which were open, and where the risks were. And I'm not sure our colleagues in, in rail, you know, they had probably probably got more stick than, than roads, actually, in terms of trains breaking down and stopping and being isolated. Um, so I, I do think, you know, we, we uh, have improved our resilience, but, um, you know, I'm not hearing like last time where, you know, we need to do a, a review and the government's going to, you know, uh, take action. Um, it doesn't seem as though, you know, the consequences have been that bad this time round. That's okay. how I see it. Like Matthew, I think forecasting and communicating and collaboration has improved hugely. And I actually said I don't think it was particularly brilliant because my personal experience was my son was stranded in Exeter, sat, you know, with his girlfriend, couldn't get back to work. Um, and, and as you say, the, the rail industry probably got much more flat than the highway mm. industry. But I do think that the communication, forecasting and collaboration between authorities is, was, has really sort of shone through. What I think is we've improved the processes, we've improved the communication, as you say, we've improved the resilience. And I think we've got the message across that there's only so much we can do. Because if we tried to do everything, it would be unaffordable. Mm. And the time and the place that we're in now, in especially, you know, would we want a local authority spending all its money keeping the roads open that people may even then take the decision not to go out anyway? Mm. You know, and I think we've, we've let, it's about this education the customer, customer again making them realise and telling them how a great job they've done. It isn't helped sometimes by the, the ambulance chasers or the media that whatever, that keep going everywhere where there's a problem, they simply find it. I mean, I thought it was quite funny when I was watching it on Saturday morning, so they'd, they'd gone over to Ireland and got stuck. You know, and they, 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 they chased the storm and found out it, it, it trapped them in the place. You know, but, uh, but the people in Ireland had been very resilient. They, you know, I thought their attitude was, so what? We can still get down the pub or something like that. It was quite funny, really. So the advice from the transport industry is, so what? <laughs> <laughs>